All right, this is take one of whatever, fuck. Um, flogging the book here, the Method of Manuscripts, it's just a kind of an autobiographical, but also some timely information about uh, designer drugs or RCs as we call them these days, research chemicals. Uh, kind of along the line of Hamilton Morris, uh, but a little more historical stuff. And hats off to Hamilton and the crew at Vice for uh, featuring Susie and I. Um, but right now what I want to do is tell a story about uh, when I was in the Merchant Marine. Um, my dad who was a fairly notorious, but wrong word, uh, he was a seaman uh, in San Francisco Bay. He grew up there, he was born there. Uh, he told me a story that he remembered seeing a boat washed up on the beach when his mom, my grandmother, was taking him out on Ocean Beach. And he said, well, gee, Ma, what's that? Why are all those police? And what's, what's all the excitement? And she said, well, that's a rum runner's boat. And they tried to come in with a load of, of alcohol. And this was during Prohibition, of course. You know, my dad was born in 1923 or so. And uh, she told him the story of the rum runners and all that. And, uh, and my dad's response was, wow, when I grew up... Oh, and of course, it was the U.S. Coast Guard that had intercepted them and driven them to the shore, and then they ran. My dad's response is, well, when I grow up, I'm going to be either a rum runner or I'm going to be in the Coast Guard. <laughs> he went to high school, and lo and behold, World War II started, so he joined the Coast Guard. Now, uh, growing up in the Bay Area, I was exposed to all that. He was building his own boat. He worked for Harbor, the, the ferry boats, and, and he, his history is uh, quite uh, extensive. But anyway, to make a long story short, I was broke in my mid-20s. I said, gee, Dad, you know, can I come and work on the waterfront with you? And he said, well, yeah, you, you need to get your uh, Siemens documents. And I said, okay, uh, what's that? And he said, well, it's just a... It's like a passport that you, when you get on a ship, you show it to them and they sign you in, you sign the articles and you, you're allowed to ship out and you can show that anywhere in the world, any port, and the port authorities will recognize you're a U.S. citizen that you're assigned to that ship. It's like a passport for seamen. And it's just a little card with your picture on it. It looks like a driver's license. It's kind of neat. So he explained to me that he, he, I had to have a letter of commitment, which is simply... An employer in the Bay Area, because even already in the 70s, the, the Merchant Marine was, you know, uh, foreign flag vessels were starting to take over. And I can explain all these terms, but I don't need to. You've all got access to YouTube and Internet. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Wikipedia. Look up foreign flag vessels, not foreign flag or, or not, you know, foreign flag attacks or whatever. No, anyway. So he was willing to create a letter of intent, which means he intended to hire me. So I was able to go to the Coast Guard and with this letter and say, oh, you, you have a pending job, Mr. Gill. Okay, fine, just sign here. And what's your criminal record? Oh, well, I got arrested for some uh, chemistry involving, you know, psychedelics. But, you know, it was all a mistake and it's all good now and everything's okay. I never got convicted. And they just said, okay. And they signed off and I got this neat little laminated document that said, uh, you know, certificate of uh, Siemens documentation, blah, blah, blah. And then the next step was I had to go to the union hall and throw my card in for a job. And in that time, the hall was the National Maritime Union. And that was right down, gosh, it was just a few blocks from the ferry building. Imagine that. NMU. Uh, threw in my car, threw in my card, and I, and I lived in the hate, so I would take the trolley down, you know, day after day after day after day, kept throwing in my card, kept throwing in my card. And lo and behold, after about six months of sitting in the union hall for six, six hours a day, I threw in my card and my number, you know, every day I was there, it kept getting higher and higher and boom, you know, suddenly my number came up and, uh, Gil, uh, yeah, you're assigned to, uh, uh, this, uh, Coastwise tanker. Uh, gosh, I can't think of the name of it now. Doesn't matter because that's not the story I'm trying to tell him. So I worked on a tanker for a few months. That was pretty neat. I got to see the Triangle Run, which is uh, Hawaii, Anchorage, Alaska, Long Beach, California, and points in between, including the Bay Area, loading and unloading oil, gasoline. Uh, they even had liquid fertilizer. It was concentrated ammonia, I believe. I got off of there, and that was great. That was fun. You know, a few months went by got some labs set up, made some interesting psychedelics. 
and some adenosine, disease, some other things that were less uh, good. Yeah, so okay, time to throw my card in again. This is getting ridiculous. I need to get out of town, so I went down to the union hall, kept throwing my card in, kept throwing, boom, I, I got a job as a saloon messman. Now, what the hell is a saloon messman? I have no idea, but I just got the job. Yeah, report to, uh, po um, report to Doc, blah, 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 in Oakland and uh, uh, meet the American Charger. Uh, so I did that thing. I took a taxi. Or, or I had Fred, my friend Fred, drive me. And Fred uh, is part of the Shep Michigan gang. Great guy. Dropped me off. Said, well, Shrieker, you know, I hope you don't get keel hauled or, or, or you know, kidnapped by pirates. And I, no, don't worry. I'll be fine. And the American Charger was a brake bulk freighter. There was still a few of those left in the, in the U.S. Merchant Marine in those days. Simply means the kind of classic cartoon ones you see with the cranes they have a uh, you know uh hold covers the hatches come off and then there's lay you know deck after deck of just stuff that you know boxes and they had all these this really complex arrangement of cranes and cables that would move the product out of the hold onto the onto the dock and back it took a while it took three or four days so anyway, I get on the ship, I'm working fine. Okay, oh, and this time, yeah, saloon messman. What that meant was I was basically the waiter for the officers. See, on uh, merchant ships in those days, they had, you know, the black gang and the white gang, and that's literally what they called it. The black, the black gang was all the workers, and the white gang was the officers. And I was in the black gang because I worked for the salute for the stewards department. In other words, the kitchen making beds, uh, washing laundry, whatever. All that stewards department. Then you have the Engine departments, firemen, pumpers, uh, the guys controlling the boilers, you know, people that worked in the engine room, their mechanics and stuff. And then you had the, um, the deck, the, you know, the deck, uh, the third was the deck, the, the able-bodied seaman that would stand watch at the wheel steering the ship. Then you had the ordinary seaman and, and uh, you know, which just swabbed the decks and look out during their hours and all that good stuff. So it was like a three... It was sort of like a, a social system, you know, it was a caste system, you know, and then uh, I had to make a long story short, so I found myself on the uh, American Charger, which was um, a brake bulk freighter, and we laid over in uh, Tacoma for a few weeks, and then, because the crew was basically on leave, there was nobody on the ship, it was great, so, and then all of a sudden, Thanksgiving rolled in, and all these guys, all these officers poured in, and they're, they're you know, loading the ship for... Uh, cruise to the, the, the Far East, and I'm like, oh my God, that's all this work, you know, I'm just basically a glorified waiter, and I'm like, oh, I'm trying to learn everybody's names, and, you know, I don't know whether to write down what they order, but, and then, and then to make it even more complicated, there was a dumb waiter between the, the uh, galley down below two decks, and us, so every single order, you'd have to, you get on this intercom, you say, okay, I need two of the, you know, I need two of the uh, scrambled eggs with potatoes. Hold the, you know, condiments and, you know, and by the time you got 20 officers in there waiting and, you know, they're, they're hungry. And, oh my God, but I, but, you know, I'm 26 years old, so I got it. I got used to it and I did it. And then uh, pretty soon, you know, our layover time is over and we shipped out for the, uh, the, uh, Far East. Now, the interesting thing was this particular ship was MSCS, or Military Sea Lift Command, MSC, I guess, I guess. And that means that their job was, although there were civilians, the Merchant Marine is all civilians, by the way, there's no, you know, but, but the, this company was contracted to supply military bases. So our very first stop was, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Pearl Harbor. And we pulled right into where all the destroyers and missile, missile frigates and submarines. I mean, I got off the ship and I, we're like one dock over from a nuclear submarine, an attack submarine. I'm taking pictures and they're all looking at me like, okay, what are you doing? Oh, that's, that's publicity. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. And go by these guys like decontaminating nuclear, like, uh, you know, it's an atomic submarine and they're decontaminating valves and stuff. They got crapped up a little bit. And, and they're looking at me like, what are you doing? Oh, it's okay, don't worry. It's just it's just uh, public relations. And they're okay, you know, go on. And I'm walking all over Pearl Harbor. and That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's super high security, you know, just same place my brother went uh, to to do diving. He's a, He became a SEAL, and he. Uh, I even saw the tower where they, they trained them for deep diving, and, and, you know, they had this 
200 foot high tower full of water, and divers are trained there. But anyway, to make a long story short, this ship was, you know, tiny compared to ships they have today. I mean, gosh, it was only 600 feet or something like that. I don't know. And uh, we go out, and of course, I'm on the low end of the totem pole, so it's winter time because all the guys who career guys get to do their stuff in the nicer weather, and you know, as it should be. So we went through some awesome storms, and you know, it was great. You know, just the ships rolling and stuff's flying around, and but you know, I just never felt endangered because the crew, the, the officers were just like, no, this is normal. No worries, you know, just just hang on, you know, just make sure your 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 stuff is secure. And I learned the importance of making sure everything, you know, you don't leave stuff out. You you secure everything. Every they have drawers that lock, and your desk has a thing that locks. And they even have in 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 the chow hall they have these things that come up so your t you know little clips that come up so your dinner can't slide off the table when the ship's rolling a lot. So, at that point, of course, I was, you know, uh, I had to bunk with a guy. So, I shared a room with a guy named Ralph, who was a, a old black guy. He'd been, in the, he'd been in the merchant marine for his whole life. And, oh, my God, he let me have it. He was just like, hey, what's this motherfucker, you know? See, ya, you don't know shit, do you? You, 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 you? I mean, he was funny. He just laid it on me every day. But he was right. I was totally ignorant. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I like, uh... Ralph, will you, will you please tell me, um, how do I get the salad from, you know, oh, come on, man, you don't know shit, come on, I'll show you, and you take me down to the deep freezer, here's your salad, you put it at it, you know, and he explained it to me, but luckily I had a Puerto Rican guy that was my workmate in the mini galley off of the, uh, the saloon mess, which, in other words, where the officers ate, and the officers ate on this level, the rest of the crew ate on the, the, the other level. <laughs> and anyway, so between uh, Ricky, what's his name? The Puerto Rican guy, really nice guy, very sweet. Had a lot of good advice for me, and he went out of his way to help me, seeing I was a newcomer, and uh, he was a great guy. But anyway, so here we are going from port to port, and uh, the ports we visited were of great interest because they were all military ports. We went to Subic Bay, and it was still open then. Subic Bay was where, especially during the Vietnam War, all the aircraft carriers would go in there, and 3,000 horny sailors would get off, and there's Subic Bay, and believe me, they got, you know, hotels and stuff to, you know, fix up everybody. They got everything they want, drugs, alcohol, and uh, plenty of women, so it was funny to see that. And, uh, you know, we went to, uh, oh gosh, where did we go? We went to Japan, we went to Jakuska, we went to Yokohama. And same thing, loading and offloading, mostly military bases. Um, interestingly, we went to Busan, Korea, which is a southern port in uh, South Korea. Still kind of military, still mostly military cargo. Most of it is just like toilet paper and whatever the military needs. Some of it was, you know, not ammo, but just weird things that had to do with uh you know uh munitions and whatever one time one trip we took a nose cone for a polaris submarine or an attack submarine it was a special rubberized thing because in the nose of a sub there's all this sonar stuff and special weird sonic radar and special instruments but it has to be fared with the hull so you know you can go fast in the water i got to see one of those nose cones taken through the panama canal but the most interesting place we visited, I suppose, was Johnston Island, or Johnston Atoll, as they call it, on YouTube. I mean, excuse me, on uh, Wikipedia. Now, this was the storage site for uh, chemical weapons, or weapons of mass destruction, as we like to call them now. There was an inventory there of thousands of tons of VX nerve gas, sarin, mustard gas, and even weirder things that they had designed for, you know warfare in the 50s and it had been sitting there for years it was leaking and they had special detectors and if the wind was blowing the wrong way and it was too hot you know everybody you know get out their atropine kits and make sure that if they develop the symptoms of uh nerve gas poisoning they'd treat it so crazy it was run by the department of energy by the way the same island was the place where they launched a couple of high altitude nuclear tests uh something able 
Baker Abel or something. It was a test that proved that there's EMP. They discovered EMP from that test. Uh, in other words, the electromagnetic energy from the bomb up at, you know, God, 100 miles or something was enough to put out the power at, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then Honolulu, the power grid was knocked down and stuff. So that was of great interest. And I got to see the launch pad where that missile was. And there was, there was a couple missiles that blew up. There's plutonium all over the place. The place is all crapped up with nerve gas and with fucking plutonium. And, you know, I'm just walking around and I'm seeing these bunkers and, you know, special VX, you know, uh, GB, I guess is the name for Sarin. All these warnings. And they have what I call the cakewalk. And they'd come out of these warehouses behind fences and then they'd have this rubberized thing. And as they came out with all their gear on... Another guy with gear would be spraying them down with bleach and uh, lye solution to destroy all the nerve gas. And then they'd peel off a layer and they'd spray them again, peel off a layer. And finally, by the end, they got to this and they have these holes in the ground where they throw the stuff, throw in more bleach and close it up. Yeah, I got to see that. I got to take pictures of it. They're on my website or wherever. But that was exciting. But the one uh, that was interesting to me that I told Sandy about... <clears throat> was uh, one of the ships I was on. Crossed through some pretty rough weather. There was a huge storm. And uh, we actually detoured south. Um, everybody's on a schedule. And, you know, you can control your engine RPM and you can speed up or slow down a certain amount. But if it's a big storm, you just kind of have to lay to and, you know, let it be and just, you know. But we were in pretty good time. However, we reached uh, Japan... And across the harbor in Yokohama, we could see a box, uh, or, I'm sorry, a car ship. It looks like a big box. It's just a big box, literally, a ship. It's a big box. It has a ramp. You go into Japan. They drive all the Toyotas and whatever's on. And uh, close it up and sail off. And that's all well and good until they hit a storm. Now, unfortunately, the captain of that ship had decided... He was behind schedule, and he would cut through the storm rather than going south of it, like as we did. The result was that he took on some pretty big waves. It rolled his ship to the point where the cars on many different decks were, that were chained to the deck broke the chains and started smashing back and forth and rolling around. And um, One of the big waves hit the, the uh, wheelhouse of the, and blew out the windows, so they're, they're like steering from the auxiliary steering below decks, radioing for help, and they, they made it out of the storm, but they lost most of their cargo, and there was a great deal of uh, damage to the ship. Uh, they were lucky to live, actually, if you want my opinion, but the bottom line is a Japanese captain, it was a Toyota contracted ship, uh, was fired. Uh, because of Malfi, he was. They told him, "No, you should have steer, steered around the storm." And, and he, but but you told me you told me I had to make it at this. No, sorry, your fault. Um, he committed uh, seppuku. He killed himself, and uh, that was that story. So that's just kind of an idea of some of the adventures one experiences in the Merchant Marine, and I got plenty more stories like that to tell. But. Of course, this is a teaser for the book, The Methadone Manuscripts, and uh, has a lot of stories about that and about uh, making psychedelics and what it was like being a psychedelic chemist in the 70s and the 80s. Because I started when I was 19, you know, 1973 or, you know, gosh, or no, uh, something like that. But yeah, I started me, I started young and I kept doing it until a federal... Interdiction of uh, 2000, March 9th, 2000. And so I was finally federally stopped in my tracks. So there you go. That's the uh, YouTube version. That's the intro for the Methadone Manuscripts. I've got a GoFundMe going. I, re I post often on uh, YouTube, I'm sorry, on Facebook under Psychedelic Chemistry. You're free to contact me there anytime. Uh, please buy my book. <laughs> Thank you.